that's an amazing story. It is. And um, we have a panelist who, we have a panel of people that have done amazing stories. And when I was looking over the stories themselves um, today and yesterday, I noticed that they all have common, they have some common themes and I, I wanted to start off that way, which is they all are stories about really vulnerable people. Um, children, children, yes. <laughs> uh, disabled, uh, in my case, um, veterans who are um, going through mental and physical um, repairing and, and drug addiction and things like that. So it wasn't just that. It wasn't just the vulnerable individuals that we all profiled, but it was also the system. Uh, and so I wanted to talk just, uh, have you talk just a little bit about how you, how you work these two tracks and whether, and how did you start out with the system or the individual? And knowing that we have reporters in the rooms, if you could, you know, always think about giving examples that might spark some idea about, you know, the next uh, investigation that you all take on. Um, so what about you, Mike? Well, of course, our job is to hold uh, powerful people accountable, um, people in government, people in the private sector. But our job is also to give people without a voice a voice. And I think often uh, we, we neglect uh, people in our communities who are voiceless because we don't have a lot of contact with them. Um, in our case, with our investigation into uh, really the, the cover-up of clergy sex abuse, our initial uh, focus was, was the institution because uh, there had been stories about clergy sexual abuse written in the past. We were interested in the allegation that Cardinal Law, uh, the Archbishop of Boston, uh, knew about the abuse and allowed it to continue. But as we did our research, we talked to a lot of uh, survivors, a lot of victims, and they were very, very uh, important to our research because they, they had information. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I think um, uh, the reforms that uh, the church has undertaken are significant, but I think the most important part of our project was really liberating tens of thousands of victims all over the world who were finally able to get people to believe their stories. So were any of those individuals able to give you tips of, that led you to understand the system better through their own, I don't know, paperwork or? <clears throat> well, very early on, uh, we decided, we started looking into one priest. And then we did some reporting and uh, quickly got the idea that there might be as many as a half a dozen. Mm -hmm. And we thought that would be an incredible story. There are, of course, now 250 just in the Boston, Ar Boston Archdiocese alone. But very early on when we thought there might be as many as six, uh, a survivor by the name of Phil Saviano came to meet with us at the Spotlight Team. And we thought we were just going to hear his story of abuse. And he had the names of 12 priests that we had never heard of. And he had pretty solid information that these were abusers. Mm -hmm. So they really did have very uh, vital information uh, and helped us understand the system uh, of, uh, of cover-up that we eventually discovered and, and revealed. Audra, what about you? Ours was um, the opposite. So ours started with um, an actual case. And so let me back up. My uh, reporting partner, former reporting partner is Carol Marvin Miller, who has been covering the social service system in Florida for two decades, and she is completely fluent in this. So she had been tracking cases of these children who were abused, and then when we would look deeper, what we couldn't understand is how this, these parents were still allowed to parent these children. When you looked at the circumstances, there was no reason that you could think of that, that these parents should still have custody. And so when we kept looking, the system kept presenting itself because the infrastructure was broken. And so when you would talk to the families and you would have parents say, yeah, my boyfriend lives here and yeah, he does drugs, but he's allowed to come back and he promises he won't do it. And that's not the question for the mother anymore. It's the question for the state because these kids are all under what's considered state supervision, whether they're in the house or not. And so what we were running was sort of a duel where we were mm -hmm. looking at the system, but we were also working very hard to give some humanity to this. And so, you know, Carol is um, by trade an investigative reporter. I am a narrative writer. And so they paired us together um, and she learned more about narrative writing. I learned more about investigation so that ultimately 
we wrote a, an investigative story that had that was built like a narrative. And so the focus at all points just about was, who are these children? Mm -hmm. And as you guys probably know, if you can go online and see, we ended up building a database of the 500 children that were killed. And in every single case, we wrote um, a bio. We wrote a story that told um, our readers how they lived, not just how they died. Mm -hmm. And that was always the focal point, is making sure we never forgot the children. Because you were dealing with children, did you have trouble uh, identifying them or because they were already deceased, was that not a was that not an issue? The key was that they they had already passed, so we had access to those records. What we didn't have, um, and what became more difficult, was that they would have siblings. Right. And so, of course, if you have children that dies in the home, you know your your concern now is what about the rest of the mm -hmm. family? And when we finally were able to, and we did, you know more FOIAs than you can remember. We sued four times, we lost one of those cases. But when we were finally able to get the whole family unit, um, a lot of change happened after the series where some of these children were removed from the homes mm -hmm. because they should not have been in the home based <clears throat> on the environment itself. So Mike, when you were talking about um, you know, this person that had the lawsuit, this Mike over here, but uh, <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> Did you have any insiders who eventually started to help you understand the system? Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, with every investigation, you look for the, the guy in the basement. There is some guy somewhere in the country who's devoted his entire life to understanding whatever it is you're trying to investigate. <laughs> Guaranteed. You know, it's that UFO guy or it's that JFK conspiracy guy. You know, in the case of the story that Trish and I did, we found a network of parents with children or adults with disabilities, and they were definitely afraid. What happens when I'm 65 years old? What's going to happen to my child? What happens when I'm not around anymore? And these were very real fears. And they made it their life's calling to understand the system. And to go back to your original question, I often begin with a system story. And that's sort of like a, a, a bad word. And, and when you go to an editor, hey, I've got a system story. And it's like, uh, go away. You know? And it's because no one wants to hear a system right. story. But th at the heart of what we do, often it is a system story. We just we put the people first. You know, but without the system, you know, the people sometimes don't have that connectivity that we're looking for. So in the first Worth Bingham uh, story with Seniors for Sale, this was about how, again, Washington was allowing seniors to be housed in residential homes. And the absurdity of it, and this is what I look for in state reports, so I, I'm sure you all go through state reports. We look for these obscure nuggets that don't make sense. But in Washington, they were allowing ordinary homeowners and, and this is in 2008, you know, 2009, height of the, the mortgage crisis, so everyone's going under in their homes. You were allowed to take up the six seniors into your home, and the state would pay you to take in these borders. And, and people were like, yeah, I get $3,000 a month per person. If I put six of them in my home, that's $18,000 a month times 12. Oh, my God, I'm rich. And they would take them in, and they had no idea how to care for them. These were people with real health issues. These weren't just you know, apartment rentals, these are people with medical issues. And so it got so absurd where, again, you look for the clues, you look for the people who can direct you, but we found a real estate site, and this was the, the, the genesis of the title, where the, the homeowners, when they get in over their heads, and people were dying or getting injured when I say over their heads, and, and they would actually list their homes for sale, and they would list them separately. I have a home that's for sale for $60,000, and if you want to three people inside it, that'll be another $100,000. Get rich, and you'd see these ads. And that's you know sort of the genesis. And so a system story, you know, going going back to my one story, of, this is going on in every state, by the way. The federal government, through a program called Money Follows the Person, is paying every state in the nation to move people from expensive care settings into the community. Maybe some of them are doing really well, but I've done two states now, two different kinds of stories, one with seniors, one with adults with disabilities, and, and both were horribly broken and people were dying unnecessarily. Audra, did you want to say that? I was gonna say one of um one of the things that we found when we were working on this series was that um, it was important to find a character, um, mm. a, a, a character who could carry it. And what we ended up with was the grandmother. The grandmother was the key mm. in so many of these cases because they recognized that their children were not um, fit to be parents, but they loved their grandchildren. And so they were willing to come they were willing to come forth and talk about the death of these children. And, you know, the grandmother, as I call it, that's a special character. She's a special person, and she's the one person that could speak to both mm -hmm. generations. 
Um, and we had them come forth, uh, and they came forth and also allowed us into their homes. And one of the things that I used to do was one, one of my sort of methods was that when I, when I would go to these homes, I was, um, one of the things I did was I spent a lot of my time uh, with the families, is I would <coughs> ask them if they had a photo album and ask them to walk me through those pictures because what it invariably did was tell the story of the children. And um, they could tell it in pictures, but they could also tell it in words. So uh, in the Walter Reed stories, we had a lot of, we had one inside source right from the beginning who, who wanted to remain anonymous the whole time, but was inside the hospital. And so our whole, one of our methods was, we, we didn't do any FOIAs, but we also worked, the Army didn't even know we were up there all the time we were there. So we had this element of surprise because we figured they would, you know, do, well, first of all, they wouldn't let us up there, but they would also probably clean up some of the things that they really needed to be held accountable for. So in your cases, did you have any time when, like, I'd love to hear how you got into these homes, but like time when you had to, you know, work around the, the government or the, you know, archdiocese uh, in, in your case, so that they weren't able to thwart you? And if so, can you explain how you did that? Well, I think in my case it was a little bit different because, because all of the victims were dead, those records were available to us. So, so you could walk into a home? No, no, those records were available, okay. which allowed us to find the people and, and go and, and you know, ask them to talk. And a lot of families didn't talk to us. Mm -hmm. You know, this, we went across the state and, you know, the ones that are featured are obviously the ones who spoke, but there were many, many who didn't want to talk. But I was just making the point that because um, the death records were public, yeah. So how did you go into the home? Did you set up a After we would get um, you know, the family, we mm -hmm. identified who they are. A lot of times we, were, um, we had confirmed the information through you know, police reports, because mm -hmm. you know, these are many times also criminal investigations. And then I would call them, or Carol would call them and say, you know, um, you know, first let me express my condolences for the loss of your grandchild or your child. We're writing this series. We would mm -hmm. love to talk a little bit about your child. Would you mm -hmm. be interested in talking? And sometimes the answer really was click. Yeah. Um, but there were other times where they would think about it. Or, you know, I spent a lot of times also sending emails saying, mm -hmm. you know, this is what I'm interested in because, you know, that process has to be exceptionally honest. Right. You can't, um, you cannot ever approach someone who has been, who's grieving or is mourning and it not be what they expect it to yep. be. You have to be so careful with the, you know, and being very sensitive. So they knew what we were looking for, but we had to make that very clear from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about accountability now? Sure. Like, you know, as a result of your stories, and maybe even as a result of the way you wrote your stories and the emphasis, were the people held accountable right away for what you were finding? or? How, yeah, did, how did that unroll? I think the, uh, they were held accountable. In the, in the case of our investigation to clergy sex abuse, uh, four months into our reporting, I don't know if you've seen the Spotlight movie, but it ends on the morning of, of the publication of the mm -hmm. first story. Right. And we expanded our team and wrote 600 more stories over the course of a year. And uh, along the, story, the series started in January. Along about April, all of the Catholic bishops met down in Dallas. And they approved a document they call the Charter for the Protection of Children and Young People. And uh, it's, a, it's a good document. I don't think they adhere to all the provisions uh, of the Charter today. But still, uh, it was a, I thought it was a pretty good effort. Uh, it required all the bishops to report um, uh, evidence or even suspicions of child sexual abuse to civil authorities, to the police. It required bishops to uh, deal with uh, complaints in a transparent way. There were some very good uh, provisions. Uh, it took uh, an entire year, and as I said, 600 stories before uh, Cardinal Law uh, fled Boston uh, and uh, took refuge in the Vatican. Uh, and, uh, and to this day, uh, there is a battle within the, uh, the Vatican uh, to, to uh, approve uh, reforms that can be applied globally to stop uh, the sexual abuse of children. And it is a, it is a, uh, it is a real hard-fought battle that's, that's being... Uh, undertaken right now. And remind us, where is Cardinal Law now? 
Cardinal Law, this is a real uh, sore point uh, for survivors. <clears throat> uh, Cardinal Law went to the Vatican. Essentially, he was rewarded uh, for his work. He was given a very prominent uh, position as what they call the archpriest of one of the five most important uh, churches uh, in Rome. And he continued to have a uh, very influential uh, role on the College of Cardinals. Uh, he also... Uh, why, why is that, do you think? Well, I think uh, there were many powerful people in the Vatican who thought uh, that he had done a good job and had been uh, railroaded by the press. Uh, and as I say, to, to, to this very day, there are very powerful people in the Vatican who are opposing reforms to prevent uh, the sexual abuse of children by priests, as, in, as incredible as that may sound. Um, so today, uh, Cardinal Law, he is uh, retired and, and no longer has uh, the influential positions that he, that he held. But he was, uh, in my opinion, never held to account by the Vatican. Well, there's something about help, hope being held account later. <laughs> I think. <laughs> Chris, and I, Chris and I had a, a different experience. If I could back up one second, it, you know, you were talking about accountability, yeah. and and yeah, for what us, what happened with all your well, with the story that we just did, you know, what, what we found is, and this is what takes months, is we we meticulously tracked each and every report. And that's what took a FOIA. We'd FOIA out a group home's entire repertoire of investigations, and we put these into a spreadsheet. You know, it's one of my favorite. Moments from Spotlight, oh. right? You know, you guys made spreadsheets sexy again. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, we actually and, didn't. The movie made spreadsheets sexy. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you recall the movie, they're, they're, in, they're in front of the spreadsheet. And goes, oh, my God, look how many there are. You know, but that, that's really the power of analytical reporting or what we call computer-assisted reporting or whatever you want to call it. But this is what Trish and I did. We, we make, painstakingly entered this stuff into a spreadsheet. So then when we started calling the state, and I always refer to it as, I, I actually tweeted this out the other day, the Columbo effect. And I said this to a, a group of Stanford students, and they looked at me blankly. Who's Columbo? Yeah. And so I just realized how old I am all of a sudden. Yeah. You know? So if you don't know who Columbo is, you'll have to you know, Twitter it or whatever, and you'll figure it out. But uh, you know, Trish and I would, would go to the state and say, you know, guys, your numbers aren't adding up. You know, we do kind of this Columbo effect of, you know, I'm just trying to understand why you guys are so screwed up. I just don't understand it. And, and we kept coming back at him, coming back. So in our case, uh, because of our, our reporting, and the, the, we're using the state's own records to tell them about themselves. They started doing reforms before we published. And so this was the accountability. The case that I was following closely, Thomas Powers, they reopened the case that Trish was following with Thomas Harge that she told you about in our presentation, they reopened before we, we they had closed these cases with no action. They reopened them. Did any uh, of the uh, people in charge of the system <clears throat> get fired? No one's gotten fired. There have been some heads to roll down in the institutional setting, and they're, they're not officially firing. So, you know, we did not get people fired per se, but I think more importantly, you know, what we have seven pieces of legislation pending. We have group home investigations reopened. We have families who are being told that there will be justice for their loved ones. We have any number of uh, accountability reforms in the works. We've been contacted by numerous legislators with more on the way. So, you know, we feel like we've opened up a system that has been previously closed. I mean, it's hard to overstate how closed the system yeah. was. Audra, what about in your case? We, um, <clears throat> we published on March 16th of 2014, and in June, um, the legislature passed the um, Florida's most sweeping uh, child reform law ever. Hmm. So right. they, they um, and the, the, the overarching theme was that they would finally put the children's best interest would have to is literally part mm. of the legislation now. So I'm going to turn to you all for questions. I'll just talk about accountability for one second on Walter Reed, which was, you know, I'd covered the military for many years before that. Never had an officer been, <clears throat> been uh, fired from his job. And in Walter Reed, uh, you know, just must have hit just at the right time because it was under Robert Gates, and he ended up firing first the uh, Army secretary. <laughs> Secretary of the Army, who um, you know made some disparaging remarks about the reporting, and and then he fired the Army Surgeon General, and then the commander of Walter Reed, and by that time, you know I think everybody was on board with uh, doing, you know putting up with reforms that then Congress threw. I mean Congress threw millions and millions of dollars at looking at the issue, and because people didn't know the difference between an active duty army hospital and a veterans hospital. They threw the veterans administration system into the, into the mix of things they were gonna look at and made a lot of reforms there. Of course, 
it is not at all perfect, but right. anyway. So let's go to the audience. And then at the end, I want you all, if you could, to, to talk a little bit about um, what you see as positive uh, trends in investigative journalism. We need more Bingham family members. Now. Yes, <laughs> that's yes. true. 